service of worship here at St. Matthew's Chapel. We're very honored that we're able to come together through social media if we can't meet physically in person. It's a wonderful opportunity to share in worship and in fellowship in this way. You should have received or could receive by this time, in addition to this video, two other resources. A copy of the bulletin, which we would normally use on Sunday morning, has been provided for you, and it contains the scripture readings as well as some of the prayers and collects. If you printed it out, you can follow the service in print or look it over before the service begins. Welcome to do that. In addition, Kirk has provided a suggested uh, trio of hymns that we would have been using uh, for the fifth Sunday in Lent, and uh, you'll find those at the end of this bulletin, in addition to some suggestions Kirk has for where you can find them online. Before we begin, I'd like to offer on your behalf our sincerest thanks to a number of people who've made this uh, presentation of this service possible. In particular, Leonard Sergis and Kathy Racine, Catherine James McGinty and Kirk Edset. There's been a lot of time and care and love and attention given to this, and I'm sure you appreciate that. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. Almighty God, to, to you all hearts are open, all, all desires known, and, and from you no secrets are given. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we say the Kyrie, Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. We offer now the Collect for the fifth Sunday in Lent, followed by the Collect for the season of Lent. You're invited to join in saying this in your own homes if you wish. <coughs> Almighty God, your, your Son came into the world to free us all from sin and death. death. Breathe upon us with the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ, and serve you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made, and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you the God of all mercy, perfect provision and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, ch starting in chapter 8, verses 6 to 11. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also, through his spirit that dwells in you. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 116, verses 1 to 8. Let us read the psalm together. I love, I love the, the Lord because he has heard, heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me, 
whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought very low, and he helped me. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has treated you well. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is written in the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning in the first verse. Glory, Glory to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. It was their brother Lazarus who was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When Jesus had said this, he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him, and let him go. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. said to them, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning's Gospel tells us of Lazarus, who has died and is restored to life by our Lord Jesus Christ. 
from death to life. And this story serves as a sort of prologue to the Easter story, the story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus himself, from death to new life. The raising of Lazarus is one and the last, actually, of a number of signs in the Gospel of Jesus demonstrating his power to give life. If you go back to the second chapter of John, you remember the story of the wedding feast in Cana when they run out of wine and Jesus provides them with wine by transforming the water into wine. You could say he gives new life to the water. That's, that's really what's happening. In the Celtic language, the word whiskey, whisque, whiskey means literally living water. So if you have a glass of whiskey, you're having a glass of the water of life. And I know in some other languages, including ours, we often talk about alcohol as being a form of spirit. So that idea is in other cultures and traditions as well. But in that opening miracle or side of Jesus, we have uh, the transformation of the water into wine as the way in which our Lord transforms the ordinary things of life into that which is very special. A bit later on, we have the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Our Lord takes two very small loaves of bread and is able to make 5,000 people satisfied with that amount of bread. Physically speaking, that's a miracle. It is also a sign that Jesus is the bread of life and that he is able to nourish all of us with his own self, with his own being. And in last week's Gospel, we heard the story of, of the man who was blind from birth being given sight. And once again, that's a kind of new life for him when our Lord provides him with sight. And it reminds us of the opening chapter of John's Gospel where uh, we hear that Jesus was life and that life was the light of the world. And in this chapter, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So in each of these, we see something material and physical being transformed into something new and life-giving. So, in this morning's Gospel, Lazarus is physically dead. There's no doubt about that. He's been in the tomb for four days. He's not in a deep sleep or in some kind of coma. He is actually and really dead. And yet, Jesus is able to restore to life one who had died. And that is the last and the greatest of the signs of our Lord's life-giving power. Lazarus is not given immortality. It's not that he never dies. He's not alive today. He, he died, as every one of us physically has to die. But his raising at this point was a sign of what we can all anticipate, that we will be raised to new and eternal life in Jesus. So this story, as I mentioned earlier, is a kind of prologue to the great story that we'll be hearing in two weeks' time on Easter Sunday, the raising of our Lord to new life and are being able to be raised with him. I'd like to speak to you this morning as well on the subject of isolation, particularly of physical isolation, because we are all experiencing that right now, not just here, but literally around the world. People are enduring physical isolation or social separation to a greater or lesser degree. And I want to share with you some insight on that subject, which uh, has been provided by one of the great spiritual writers of the day, Father Henry Nouwen. Some of you may have heard of Father Nouwen. He has influenced and inspired literally millions of people through his books and through his talks. And at one point, Father Nouwen speaks about being alone, about physical isolation. And he makes a very important distinction between loneliness and solitude. Being alone, he said, feeling lonely is a very negative experience. It can bring about anxiety, fear, confusion, depression. People, in fact, can be alone physically in, in large crowds. It's a feeling of disconnectedness, of isolation in that respect. Solitude, Father now says, is being alone with God. Being alone with God. And solitude gives us the opportunity to experience the 
presence of God in our lives and in our hearts. God is really and truly present with us wherever we are at whatever time. Now, I know some people think of God as being very far away. I've often heard that. Oh, God must be millions of miles away. There's a whole universe to look after. How can he possibly have time? How can God possibly have time to pay any attention to me? Well, that's the miracle of the Incarnation. The miracle of the Incarnation is that the Creator of the universe became human, shared our nature with us, so that God can be truly present to us. That's a real presence. That's not a product of the human imagination or wish fulfillment or anything like that. This is the ultimate truth of our faith. And we can develop a loving relationship with the person of Jesus. And when we do that, we have a loving relationship with God. We talk of Jesus as a brother, as a friend, as a teacher, as a leader, even in the right sense as a lover, one who above all loves us, cares for us, wishes us well. And that's the presence of God in our isolated sections wherever we are that we can have a relationship with. with, with. You can even talk to Jesus if you want. Who's going to know you're in your bedroom, nobody else around. If you want to talk to Jesus, go ahead. Develop that relationship. Develop that feeling of being loved and being present with someone. If you understand, if you understand that the Lord is with you, truly with you, that will transform your prayer life because you will be praying to a friend. When you read the Gospels, and you've got lots of time maybe now to read the Gospels, you will be reading and getting to know a friend, a brother, a companion, one who loves you and cares for you. At the very conclusion of Matthew's Gospel, just before physically Jesus leaves his community of disciples, he says to them, I am with you always. Not I have been with you or I will be with you, but I am with you, the presence of Christ in our lives. I'd like to conclude with a verse from a hymn attributed to St. Patrick, sometimes called St. Patrick's Breastplate. You may know the opening of it, I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity. And here is a portion of that hymn. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ in heart of all that love me, Christ to comfort and restore me. Amen. confess the faith of our baptism as we say together I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord he was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary he suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again he ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God.
We pray for the province of Ontario and for its Premier Doug Ford. We pray for our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, for the members of his cabinet, for the members of all parties in our government. We pray especially at this time for Elizabeth our Queen, for Prince Charles and for his recovery from the virus. We pray as well for the world, for, for all, all who work for justice, freedom, freedom and, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for, for the, the victims, victims of, of hunger, fear, injustice and, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those, those who minister to the sick, the, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. We pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for Linda, our Christ. For John, our bishop, for Shane, our bishop elect, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. We pray for our own special needs at this time. In particular, under this crisis, we pray for all those around the world who are living in anxiety and uncertainty. Almighty God, you are afflicted in the afflictions of your people. Regard with tender compassion those in anxiety and distress. Hear their sorrows and their cares. Supply all their many needs. And help both them and us to put our whole trust and confidence in you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray also for those in healing ministry. Almighty God, whose blessed Son Jesus went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people. Continue, we beseech thee, this gracious work among us. Especially we pray for doctors, nurses, other medical staff, all those working in frontline or high risk occupations. Cheer, heal, and sanctify the sick. Grant to physicians, surgeons, nurses, wisdom and skill, sympathy and patience. Send down your blessing upon all who labor to prevent suffering and to forward your purpose of love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray as well for all those who have died in the peace of Christ, for those whose faith is known to you alone, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray together, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your, in your compassion, compassion, forgive us our, our sins. sins. Known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in the newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confer and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in the eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds 
in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.